So you got your black belt in 1997 from the Machados, if that's... My, yeah, I got... Yeah, 97, that's right. Yeah. And according to Wikipedia, at least, you coined the, the phrase the Dirty Dozen? Is that, I did, that's true. Right, so what, one of the first uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belts outside of uh, Brazil itself, um, is that... Yeah, I was... Uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, it's changed a few times over the years, this people's views on this but I think I'm number 12 I, I, yeah, I just slipped right. into my own dozen okay. I yeah, was about yeah. 8 but then other people yeah. have claimed that they got it before me and people talk about the dates and uh, no one's quite sure so there's a bit of contention about that not that it matters so that's uh, <laughs> that's quite a long time ago now I, I mean I was born in 1996 there so. you go awesome <laughs> <laughs> so um, looking at that and how far kind of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu has come it was very obscure at the time you got into it what's your kind of story I mean you were you were a journalist uh, looking at martial arts is that right or oh were, no I was a martial artist oh you were, you were travelling around trying to find different martial arts and came yeah across, I was so. well I I had um I'd been traveling. I never really had a job. I, I left school, I immediately traveled to Southeast Asia, traveled and trained around Southeast Asia from 1975 to probably 1982. And then uh, I guess about the mid 80s, I started the magazine, Australia's Martial Arts Magazine, a magazine called Blitz. Right. And I just started that in my back in my back room um, with my Commodore 64. Right. Like yeah, an yeah. old style computer. Wrote all the articles, took all the photos, did the whole magazine myself. Did four issues a year. I mean, it was you know it was good. It, it made me pocket money. It kept the wolves from the door, and it gave me an excuse to travel. So it paid right. for the odd plane ticket. You know, wasn't much money, but it was enough to travel and train. So I think it was around the second issue of that, a Brazilian guy came to Australia uh, called uh, Marcelo Beirin. Right. Um, he's he's passed away now. He was killed, actually. But And he issued a challenge, $50,000 for anyone who wants to fight. No rules. Right. That seems kind of normal nowadays, maybe, but back then, that was not heard of. Like, people didn't do that. No one took him up on the offer. So, uh, I got curious about that. I wrote an article, and I, I, that ended up leading me over to Los Angeles, where I tracked down a couple of guys teaching out of their garage in, uh, in Torrance. Which was Hori and Gracie, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so so when you kind of got into Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, what about it? That what was it about it that made you kind of fall in love with it, or decide it was something that you had to study further? Well, I I guess it was the the guys I I met on my on my fifth lesson. I met Hegan Machado, who we became good friends. Like even just one lesson. Well, we, you know, we didn't become good friends in one lesson, but we you know we hit it off. Like there was a simpatico there. So he said to me, uh, come down to Brazil and train. So six months later, I did exactly that. And then not knowing who I was with, I was on the mat, you know, with all the Machado brothers. Who else was in their class? Their students were like, Henzo Gracie was a brown belt. High and Gracie was a blue belt. Half Gracie was a purple belt. Hillion Gracie. All these guys were in the one class. And so I just thought, oh, they're just the normal guys. Well, they weren't. They were kind of exceptional, yeah. but I didn't know at the time. So I was hanging out with them. And I just kind of liked them, and they were really nice to me, helped me out a lot. So that's what, and of course, the efficacy of it. Um, meaning after my first five lessons in America, before I went to Brazil, I, came, I had five lessons, literally five private lessons, went home to Australia, found every judo black belt and Japanese jiu-jitsu black belt I could find and asked them for a role, a bit of randori, a bit of sparring, and I beat them all with right. what I'd learned in five lessons. So I thought, yeah, yeah. maybe I better do ten lessons. Yeah. You know, yeah. And then on it went from there. So it was the ef the efficacy of it that, that yeah. got me there. That's not yeah. what's kept me there, though. So you were, like, taking some pretty big opportunities, though, to, you know, like, if I was asked now, kind of come over to Brazil or whatever and... I, you know, I've got a, I've got a job, or at least it, appear, it appears to me that there's this set path in life that's really comfortable and you know security and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. How, how did you kind of take these opportunities and not worry about you know the the money or how it's going to work yeah. out and stuff like that? How were you feeling at the time with it? Well, well, I was already you got to understand, Nathan. I, I was already a bit of a I would have to say a a, a, a professional well a vagabond. I was yeah. already a vagabond. I was always right. I was already you know backpack on my back living in Asia in slums and hovels and this is and that's and 
eking my way, like doing whatever I needed to do to get fed and whatever yeah, yeah. the hell. Um, did some work for the police, you know, under undercover work in Bali you know, right. and, and things like that just to get a motorbike for a week. Yeah, that was okay. my pay. I so right. did all these silly things. So I was kind of in that mode. Um, yeah. I, and I guess the first time I actually earned some steady money was when I started that magazine. Right. You know, I, I had I, I was earning equivalent to a wage, you know, a wage in Tesco or something like that. I don't know what it is, but pretty basic, but enough. Um, so, but even then it was, I, I was still didn't have to, I didn't have to get up at eight o'clock, go to work, you know, and all that stuff. And that and that work was transportable. I could <coughs> take it with me. Yeah, uh, I, I only had to be home um, four times a year. Uh, you know. When you were kind of doing all this, did you ever have like an overarching goal you were aiming at with your life? Or no way. Start, no, just in the <laughs> no, moment. Not at all. No, not at all. I mean, uh, it, my life looks like it's very organised to my friends now. Like when they look at it, um, but absolutely not. I just, I really just went with the flow. Right, uh, and I, I was very comfortable doing it, and never freaked out about the future. I always just figured I had this innate thing of it's really going to work out. Like right. okay. I'm going to write some books, I'm going to do this and do that, and yeah, I'm going to yeah. end up, and, and it all worked out just like I kind of thought it would. I didn't have a plan. Right. Okay. So, um, in terms of going from traveling around the world and sort of training with these kind of people who are who are big in the sport. To actually setting up your own gym and stuff, what what kind of happened in, in between that period in the transition process? Right. Well, I already had a school. Oh, okay. Right. A martial I, arts. School, yes, I had a small martial arts school. You know, like in a basement, forty students. Yeah. Again, enough to make me some pocket money. Um, so it was like a bit of pocket money from the school, and then the magazine later on. You know, added yeah. more. So I had a several income streams. Um, so I already had a school and then I'd go away and there'd be people that'd take over while I was away and they'd right, come back okay. um, so I already had that and then after Brazilian and so I, when I started Brazilian Jiu Jitsu I was just adding that in you know okay. adding it like a lot of people do they um, just mix a little bit of groundwork into their current stand up yeah, game yeah. and then over the years it slowly took over you know instead of 10% BJJ and ninety percent stand up. It it went the other way around. Um, yeah. That happened all again. No plan. It was just organic, right? Uh, and driven by my interest, I just became. I was I was interested in the ever growing complexity of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, right. which you can appreciate. Whereas the stand up stuff, you know, it, of course you can you, you can never master it, but it's easier to wrap your head around it, right? more quickly yeah whereas Brazilian Jiu Jitsu offered something new and sparkly every day you know so okay. it was like a new puzzle every day and that kind of uh, led me more down that track and so I started teaching more BJJ classes especially as I got higher ranks I didn't really start you know promoting BJJ until I got a black belt though right yeah yeah around you know in the late 90s yeah yeah, and when you kind of saw the first UFCs happening and the effect that had in America, I mean, maybe because the internet wasn't as prolific back then, and it, it might not have had the effects it could have had. But um, for sure, there were you know big changes in a lot of martial arts. Pe- people who were in that world saw it and were like, "This little little Brazilian guys come out and choked out all these guys who were saying, you know, oh, I'm the toughest." And yeah. uh, how did that kind of affect your your universe, or how how were you involved in any of that? Well, I. It, 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 it almost certainly, I mean, well, it certainly affected everyone's universe in terms of BJJ awareness and people wanting to do BJJ. It didn't affect me personally because I was already a purple belt at the right. time that the uh, UFC started in 1992. Yeah. So I was watching that as a purple belt. And so it was like, of course, you know, like right. it was yeah, no yeah. big surprise to me that... Yeah. That was just like, come on, hurry up, catch did, up. Did you see us. like a massive influx at the time though? Afterwards, no, or, not no. not for not for about. I would I would have to say there was no perceived like public awareness until a couple of years after. I I reckon I would say ninety four. I reckon ninety five, mid nineties, right, is where normal human beings started saying we should have a go at this. Yeah, because prior to that, I think. Maybe when the UFC started, fighters, you know, fighters, guys were coming in the gym already with cauliflower ears, twitching or whatever, you know. They're, they're, so we got those people, a few, 
Yeah. Uh, a lot of skeptics who wanted to have a go, you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, but the normal people, not until, yeah, yeah, you know, mid to late nineties, I would think. Okay. In terms of like um, teaching jujitsu, I've kind of found because I've been helping Adam with the intro classes now for just over a year, mm. and I, I kind of see people come in from their jobs and they're all uptight in their body, like their postures all messed up. They're um, they're kind of the first time they touch someone they're shaking because of it and then yeah. and then you see after a few sessions they develop this confidence in themselves yeah. they they can open up talking a bit more it it, it seems to give people like this area in their life what, that they can control even if everything else has kind of gone to shit for them yeah. and you see that affect them positively you know over the weeks and months and um, i was wondering what's kind of is, is there anything like that in terms of teaching people that you see yourself giving or have seen over the long term what's what's that kind of process that you think BJJ not just in terms of as a sport but how it affects people's lives what you see well that's a pretty big question yeah, um, yeah I think that you know to start out with BJJ is it's a little weird in a way because it's pretty much out of control you know so I, you say they feel a bit more control I, I actually think at, at the beginning they feel like yikes you right. know someone threw me in the river I can't swim yeah. what the hell's happening here certainly in most clubs yeah most academies I, I, I'm not like that I, I have an intro class and then a novice class then an intermediate class and yeah. then an advanced class so yeah. it's a it's a gradual process um, but most people are thrown in the deep end and, but I think it's the fact that I, I've got, I mean I've got some general uh, just very general comment first which is about Adrenaline. Let's let's say adrenaline sports. Yeah, I think people like that adrenaline sports, and I think the reason is nothing to do with the adrenaline, and I think it's to do with being in the now. Right. You you know when you're rolling or training, you are not worried about next Friday's meeting or what happened last Tuesday. Yeah. You are very present. You know in the moment. Yeah. yeah. When someone's trying to choke your neck or you're trying to get them off the mound or whatever. So I think that that. Maybe downhill skiing does the same thing. I don't know. Like you know, like a form of meditation or being in flow state. Is it? Yeah. In flow state, but yeah. in the moment, you're, you're you're not being pulled out of the present. You're right. very present, and I think people like that because the rest of a lot of people's lives is really not like that. There, yeah. they're living in the past, like right. what happened yesterday, what I've got to do, blah, blah, and what yeah. I've got to do tomorrow. They they're living that way. So BJJ brings you into the moment. I think, and I think something about us inside. Yeah. likes that and wants more of it right uh, yeah do you, do you have like other pursuits outside of BJJ that have ever kind of obviously you had the martial arts before Jiu Jitsu came in but other other pursuits that um, have kind of taken your interest as much as Jiu Jitsu in that regard oh no oh in that regard or, or ju- just in the regard of kind of challenging you and bringing you into the moment and uh... well certainly nothing as complex as BJJ <clears throat> however I mean I like fly fishing right okay um, and I, I've done that for 20 odd years and I'm, you know, in some very remote spots. I, I like to, a couple of times a year, go out to some really remote spot, get dropped off by a helicopter, yeah, 100 kilometers from the road in the northern Australia and then hike out, stuff like yeah. that, and, uh, and fish um, or fly fishing in traditional spots like New Zealand and stuff. So that's very, that, that, uh, yeah. that keeps me tethered to the present when you're out there doing yeah. that. Uh, so I, I kind of like that. I mean, I've heard, I've heard, because I've heard you talk about techniques and say the middle way, you know, like there's a technique that's, that's this way or this way for a body type, but there's like the middle way of the techniques. And uh, you were kind of, and a, a lot of things you've kind of said apply out to, to general life. And I was wondering what are the main lessons from jujitsu that kind of carry over into a- anything in life or, you know, Miyamoto Musashi kind of talks about the way a lot in, in his writing yeah. and other people have in, in martial arts have kind of inferred from that yeah uh, what you know how do you see it it tra- translating out of out of the mats into people's workplaces or big into question that's a book about three inches thick yeah, yeah. Um, I mean um, the, the, if you were to give like the main the main I, one I think that being present being in the moment is a very big thing yeah I think um, l- understanding that outcome is a result of process is a very very big thing. That's maybe one of the biggest things I've been able to do. So you know, if you if you want to um, you want to set up a kimura from side control, yeah. you've got a lot of steps to go through to do that. Um, and the more steps you have in that process, the more likely you can rely on the outcome. Um, so instead of focusing on the outcome, I want the kimura. You focus on 
the first step of you know six or eight steps and then the second step and six so if i want to apply that in life if someone wants to lose 20 pounds of weight they don't have to that goal is ridiculous the goal is to obscure and it's too far away from their present state yeah so you don't lose 20 pounds you lose one pound yeah and you do that 20 times yeah and so that's a very process driven so therefore uh challenges that things that might challenge you like you want to buy a home right okay everyone wants to buy a home or you want to buy five homes you can you can say that i want to i want to own five homes and get five income streams yeah, and do all you've that you've got to save a 10 percent deposit first for, yeah. for your first home yeah. you know yeah. and, so, <laughs> and not only that you've got to you've got to back that up even more and say i've got to stop going out and partying every friday and saturday night and put that money aside so you know so you, you just do these little things and they turn into bigger things which turn into bigger things and turn into bigger things so that's process and process is something that i got out of bjj that right. i didn't have before that okay okay um so that's another thing um the obstacle is the way uh, yeah, you yeah. know there's a book called that anti-fragility another great book by yeah. nasim talib and okay. BJJ gives you that, you know, it makes you robust, you know, yeah. it's like, you can't, it's, you're going to, you're going to deal with some stuff yeah. and you have to deal with it um, and you'll grow and get better. And, and so that's very important for life because nowadays, especially nowadays, especially is people are so weak. I yeah. mean, well, this was something I wanted to kind of <laughs> ask you about my generation specifically. Oh. So millennials, you know, we're kind of, we're known as wanting instant gratification, the social media age, everything gifted to us on a plate. And I wondered, um, especially through teaching, etc., if you're kind of seeing that change in yeah. in my generation as they come in, are they are they kind of weaker? Are they, or, or yeah, just further out in culture as well as outside of? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't mean to say weak. You know, I, it's just different. Um, you right. know, my my great grandfather would probably say I'm weak. You know, like, oh, okay. you know, yeah, we went yeah, through yeah, some yeah. real world wars. I haven't done yeah, that. Yeah. So. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's hard and it's hard, right? Yeah. But um, it's just that things are different now, you know, and there's people with agendas, you know, and <laughs> weird agendas and trying to make jobs for themselves and people need safe spaces and <laughs> yeah, all of this kind of craziness in my view. Um, so the problem, there are a lot of problems for that, but one of the problems that I see, literally see, is that people have a sense of entitlement Right um, now, that not everyone, but a lot of people that certainly did not exist when I was twenty. Right, you, no one was entitled to anything. Like you know, you're entitled to try, you know, yeah, give it a yeah. shot. Yeah. Um, but you, you, you didn't do. But people wake up now thinking that a, a lot of people thinking they have an entitlement to something, and that yeah. that's just weak. Um, and a lot of the times now we are protected. Which is nice in a way, right? You're protected. There's a safety net in society. You know, if you're unemployed, if you're healthcare and all this stuff. So in a way, that's great. I mean, I would like everyone. I would. I don't want people yeah, to suffer. Want to be, yeah. I don't want people to suffer in the world. Of course, I want to help people. But at the same time, giving someone a crutch mm. that is a perfectly capable human being is not helping. Yeah. It's destroying them. Now yeah. they're working with a limp. I mean, so I think you need to be... Um, you need to be more people. A lot of people need to be more robust, and um, and the way you get that is by getting a small dose of drama. Yeah, yeah. And you overcome it, and then you yeah. get a bigger dose, and you overcome that. Like weight training. You, yeah. You, you you change because you put some demands on you. You're not going to change if you don't put the demand. You put the demand. You improve. You change. You increase it. You change. So whether it's fitness, whether it's weight training, whether it's whatever, you need to do that. Yeah. And if those pressures aren't put on you, you're going to be weak. And then one day when you, when it's, when you are called upon, yeah, yeah, when uh, it comes down to it, when it those, comes down to yeah. it, you might, you know, maybe crumble. Yeah. Whereas our grandfathers wouldn't. Yeah. They just man up. Yeah. Well, that's that's a major part of, um, especially male development, is like you know wrestling and pushing those boundaries to find out that you're kind of tougher than you think or find where those limits are. And I know you're not the biggest fan of the kind of education system you were saying the other day about how you'd, um, you know, you'd like to kind of teach people how to think at some point rather than like what to think or these useless kind of objective facts that might change if we kind of do more research, but it's just a memorized, it's not an embodied kind of knowledge. Yeah. Um, I I wondered if you kind of, 
do, do you have an opinion on on culturally why any of this is happening? I mean, is it because it's so easy for people to kind of get food nowadays, or society's kind of got so big? I mean, because uh, you you've been around a lot longer than me, and I, I kind of have my perspective on these things. And I've probably got certain media outlets I consume which might give me a particular view. So I like to ask people if they take their life experience and look at where things are in the, in the West, and you know things are very politically polarized at the moment as well. Um, what what's your opinion on why those things are happening? Oh, a difficult question. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. yeah. I'm not is sure. There, is there any one reason, or is it you know, oh, no, so no, complex? No, I think so, it's not one reason. Yeah. Um, I don't more think complex. so. It's m- way more complex than that. Yeah. You know, it's the education system, um, people creating jobs for themselves. Right, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, for someone to make a safe space at a university, someone made a job. At, they, 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 yeah. They yeah. had to create a job to get that going for themselves, which is, in a way, interesting. I mean, good on people for... You know, finding a niche, right? Yeah. I mean, everyone's trying to. We're all in, in in a way, far left, right, whatever. We're all trying to just make our way through life, and yeah. we're all trying to do it um, the true. best way we can. And so, I'm not so. You know, I, I have very strong views about what I want. Um, yeah. And what I would. Like, well, you wouldn't I, enforce that on. Of someone. course not, yeah. because because no, because because other people have they're, they're finding their way. Yeah. You look at and we look, look back at myself when I was nineteen, jumping fences and stealing chickens to eat. I mean, right? You know, like a complete idiot. <laughs> I mean, so we're all trying to find our way, and, and we're doing our best. And um, if some some people create a little niche, and you and I might not agree with that niche, but yeah, they're, they're, yeah. they're creating a niche. They yeah, might yeah. not agree with my niche. Um, so I think it's you know, it, it's all of that. People trying to create jobs. They're trying to. You know, the, the education and the university culture and all that's a big part of it. You know, yeah. these things are coming out of that. Yeah. Uh, people creating new weird courses that. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. that. I mean, you know, it's cute. You know, to have these little courses and something to do, but it, it's not going to work for them in life. Well, I, I like gonna... something you said about um, how you designed your house and you kind of took the process of learning. Yeah. Um, how to do the parts of architecture that you wanted and mm. you applied them to your life but you didn't need to get an accolade for it you know like a certificate that says oh I can do this you didn't need to learn about all the all the liturgy and law and whatever um, and I think I think you know I've, I've always had the thought of say if someone's going to be an author or an artist they can kind of you're going to write books and the market will decide whether they're valuable or not you don't need you know, someone in a in a university to say, yeah, you hit the mark scheme, like, or or maybe you know they'd they'd read your book and go, you didn't hit the mark scheme, but everyone wants to buy that book. That's surely a better denomination yes. of its success. Than- yeah, well, I think I mean people people you know they can go to university because they that's the pathway that's very you know people have walked that path before them. Yeah, it's so the it's security. Easy, right? It's easy to go down that yeah. path that other. It's harder to just go left. Yeah, yeah, you know, because you don't know what's going to happen. Mm. Um, lots of stuff, things called learning, <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah, drama, yeah, and then you're going to get robust um, and yeah. all of that. Um, but also stuff that no one's seen and done because yeah. you're trailblazing. So I like that. Not everyone can do that, but um, that for me personally, that's that's the only fun. I'm not going on a trail when I yeah, go yeah. walking. I'm yeah. going left. I'm I'm heading away from that trail. Um, but you know. People, uh, look, I'm one for, you know, you can, of course you can go to school and become an architect and do all those things. Yeah. But you don't need to. Um, I mean, you might need to if you want to be a architect for the public. But yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. But to because you have, there's laws you have, to, you have to abide by and comply with. Yeah. But if you just want to do the design, you do design by designing. Yeah. If you want to write books... You do. You learn how to write by writing things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you do journalism by doing what you're doing now. That, yeah. A course won't. You don't do that by doing courses. I mean, you learn. What, you see what other people have done, but you can do that yourself. Yeah. So I would never let. I mean, you can go the university route. Of course, everyone does, but you don't need to. And if you write well enough, and you can sell books. Yeah. And make money. I have done that. Yeah. Not, I didn't write it to make money, but I've sold 
ten thousand books. Like well, I always I ask people, to what's, uh, do you know what Charles Dickens' degree is? That's what I, I mean. I don't know myself, but I always ask people that. Is it, <laughs> I, I have but, no but idea. You, but I'm yeah. sure he didn't have one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, ca- I kind of inferred as well that you're a fan of uh, Jordan Peterson. From you were talking about industriousness and conscientiousness uh, the other the other day, and I, I wondered, is that have you kind of like looked into his? Work at his work in psychology and applied that to your kind of no your school at all. Only recently I was right una- unaware of Jordan Peterson. Yeah, until thirty people said to me, "Well, he's been around Australia recently." I think doing I don't know if that had ha- would have had any effect or if it's all through the internet. But yeah, uh, no, no, um, no. A lot of people just. I, I, I spoke some. I said some things about different things. Okay. Uh, and people said, okay. "You sound like this other yeah, guy." Yeah. And enough people said that that I, I, I googled it. I said, okay. "Who yeah. is this guy?" That people. Yeah. And, I, and now I take it as a compliment. Okay. Because um, yeah. I, I don't mind um, some of the, the things. I haven't watched. I watched a couple of his things. Well, he's often taken out of context by people who don't like the conclusions he draws about things. So, for yeah. example, he had an interview with Vice where. Um, the guy was saying the, the guy was talking about kind of like gender roles and stuff and he said uh-huh. you know yeah we should have a conversation about whether women should wear makeup in the work he wasn't saying his opinion is women shouldn't wear makeup in the workplace right. but he said well you know the site pe- women wear makeup as a sexual display you know like r- rouge on the lips that's what happens when uh, women are sexually aroused that's why right. they do it the um, high heels are associated with pelvic tilt mm-hmm. so oh. um, you know it should at least be on the table for discussion he wasn't making a point and then you know all of a sudden Jordan Peterson says women shouldn't wear makeup in the world but, uh, you know and yeah. and then he's, he's presented as this when, yeah. when I think a lot of what he's do- doing is kind of just trying to have a negotiation and discussion in- no, Nathan people I as long as I've been aware people tend to take List, hear what they want to hear. Right. Um, you know, you because I've written um, maybe fifteen hundred blogs. Yeah. And like I could write something down that I, in my mind I'm very clear and precise about what I'm saying, and then I'll get someone's opinion on that. And and I, I, what the hell? Right. They really yeah, misheard yeah. what I've said. So um, and it's not their fault. Yeah. No matter how careful I was, because when we look at something or read something or listen to someone, we listen through a prism of our experience. Yeah. And, um, you know, it can really be... This is how wars start. I mean, really? you know, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. so, yeah, you know, no one's to blame. Um, you just got to be... And you can be as precise as you want to be. Mm-hmm. It, it's almost irrelevant. People won't... Right, yeah. yeah. They only got to li- li- not hear one word of that sentence. Yeah. Um, so... Yeah, people could misread what that guy uh, Peterson says. Someone actually recently gave me his new book. I haven't read it yet. Right. Okay. Yeah. Twelve rules of something or other. Twelve rules for life. My girlfriend's right. been reading it. I right. think she's yeah. yeah. Anyway, but but I, no, I came up with like the other night my um, attention to detail would be yeah. my number one. I've got a whole bunch, but yeah. my like, my own rules. So I've been yeah. doing that, writing my own rules for yeah. forty years now. Um, attention to detail. Um, yeah industriousness yeah and non-automatic acceptance of the status quo right um, would be my top three yeah if you want to really get stuff done but I mean I I, I don't know what he says um, well he, he talks a lot about his um, the big five personality trait tests oh, oh, which I think oh. are um, openness agreeableness conscientiousness which is where industrious is kind of like an right. element of that and um, then I've got got the others but um so in terms of like agreeableness like men tend to be more disagreeable than women but you know you can get one or the other kind of an average uh openness you know if you if you're very open you're going to be more creative yeah and, and right where if, if, if you're less open you're not going to be of course yeah um conscientiousness so, is like agreeableness and orderliness so it's kind of like a mixture of yeah. how much you like your boundaries defined yeah. and also how kind of how industrious you'll be and he kind of says con Conscient, uh, sorry, orderliness is sort of almost more biologically determined, whereas industriousness is something you can kind of control yourself. Work on it. Yep. Yeah. Well, I've, I've learned all these things from the mat. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. All, all, of, all of my observations, which I suppose, if they're true, you know, they'll be true regardless of what people say about them. But the fact that two people have come to these conclusions—one through studying psychology, one through teaching jujitsu, etc.—I'd say. Would, yeah. Would, I mean, he's probably—is he? 
he's was he a clinical he, psychologist? he's a clinical psychologist but he's also been a lecturer in psych at uh, right. Harvard and Toronto okay yeah so he might have done a lot of sessions with clients yes um, so I, I've done about 26,000 uh, classes yeah on the mat and I've got a, a lot of the observations I've made and not not by rote I don't I don't I, I would like to think I didn't do one of those 26,000 on autopilot yeah maybe one or two when I was injured or something and just okay. dealing with the injury like um, really badly so but so I've looked at them I've looked at how people respond and um, and learn and who gets better and why right. and why do two people with the same training get very different outcomes and yeah, yeah. so I've done a lot of I've done that 26,000 times you, you learn some basic things <laughs> you'd have yeah. to be silly, pretty silly not to right yeah um, you know and, and you learn things like those pe- some people pay attention to detail right at the start others don't you get a different outcome yeah um, and, and and you learn things like given three minutes to drill a technique two guys will do 15 reps the other two over, t- over there will do eight reps now you, yeah. you you then extend that out over two years basically those two guys on the left that you first saw have done twice as much training in the same amount of time of course yeah. they're better <laughs> you know so be industrious in that in that time that you got to do those reps and then, then you notice the thing I've noticed in what I've noticed on the mat, exactly the same happens off the mat. Yeah. For exactly the same reasons. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it's no different. You, you, you mentioned Miyamoto Masashi at the beginning, yes. you know, and one of yeah. the things that he says to know one thing is to know 10,000 things. And I, yeah. I 100% agree with that. If you really know something or you come to a deep understanding of something and a realization of a point in something, Gardening, flower arranging, or jujitsu, you're going to probably realise that that is a truth. Let's call it that. Yeah. Uh, and that's going to be everywhere. Yeah. You go. Yeah. yeah. Adam's got. Um. You know. He, he he always uses the word like hustling, and a lot of his hustle. Yeah. Yeah. A lot, a lot of his kind of that's like a good uh, word. things he teaches <clears throat> is to do is say when you when you pass in someone's guard, like you get tired, right? Count to five in your head and keep passing for those five seconds. You know, when you just when you like, I'm going to stop and give up because my thighs are full of lactic just keep moving for five seconds and see what happens kind of thing you know things like that just go in that extra mile yeah uh, always always be doing something productive and I think that's why I've uh, enjoyed kind of learning under him is that industriousness yes and, and in the factory uh, the factory logo Vincent on the industry yeah. you know like the industrious person can conquer all things I think that's really helped me as a person you know and all it's a uh, it's very good Adam's a smart guy uh, yeah, you know, way smarter than people maybe first yeah, realize, yeah. and um, you know, he, yeah, he, he's really good. And so those things, you know, attention to detail. Um, you don't see people that can't do that getting very far in anything. Yeah. Um, and I've heard that. I've asked people that are the the best in the world at their given thing. Yeah. Several different people. Tana Umaga, rugby right. um, student of mine. Um, okay. uh, Gary Borger, fly fishing, best in the world. Like so, different people. And I, I, I asked them a very obvious question: If there was one trait, what is the most important trait? And almost everyone I've ever asked has said attention to detail. Right. So you know, and I've found that to be the same. So I think that's yeah. super important. Um, and industriousness, you've just covered that off. Yeah. I, you know, we've all got the same amount of time, but some people just get. Lots more done with their day, and other people. Women tend to get more done. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure. Well, they tend to be more women. conscientious. That's but what. my my yeah. wife, she gets more done than me. I mean, yeah. than three guys. She, she three guys could not keep up with her, and she still does it gracefully with yeah. time and all that because she just organised has to do all these things. Like um, that's great, you know. Women who run a household, my goodness, they get shit done. Um, it's certainly my wife because she does right. all that plus teaches classes plus does her yeah. own training you know and all that so um, and disagreeableness um, you mentioned yeah you know yeah. I, I would I would put that a different way because um, that seems negative yeah. yeah but I would say it's more about not automatically nodding your head yeah. you know 
someone says this is the way to do it, don't start nodding your head. Hang on. Now, I may well agree with you, Nathan, yeah. but I'm going to back up a bit, get more yeah, information, yeah. think about it for a Try little bit. Try and objectively look at it right. And then I might go, Nathan, I yeah. fully agree, but I'm not going to yeah. automatically agree. That's called a lemming. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone who automatically agrees is not engaging, men- they're not engaging their mind. And um, that's why I look at techniques. Um, and and, and the, the way I, ca- I came to that a lot of ways, but my father was very influential like that. Right. Um, ta- taught me to not, just don't be conventional. Taught me the alphabet backwards, not forwards. Um, yeah. You know, did lots of funny little things like that. Yeah. Um, and taught me to be unconventional, not to be unconventional for unconventional sake but to think for myself yeah, yeah and that way you don't follow you know you can follow idiots but you're choosing to you you're making a decision to do that I mean, how would you go about teaching these you know because you said um you know it's something you should write a book about but what kind of like is there any practical advice that you could give people to try and kind of teach them how to think or is it more it does it have to be embodied like it's like well just turn up at a jiu-jitsu class and do a year and you'll figure it out okay. Well, what you said there, figure out. I mean, yeah. right. You, you can't figure out without thinking. Um, so I think you need to give people, you put them in situations where they have to figure things out. Yeah. Like like you. And and then they will start to engage. They might, But if you're providing everything for that person, right. like what we were talking about earlier on, you know, yeah. everything is given to them. Not much thinking required there. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, 100,000 years ago, we had to innovate. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, we had to, I've got to cross that river. I've got to get from the top of Africa across to the other side of Europe. I've got rivers to cross. I can't do that. I need a teamwork. I've got to think. I've got to plan. There's a winter coming. Oh, my goodness. I, I, I better start storing food. There's an idea. Innovate or die. <laughs> yeah, think ahead. So that's, you know, you go out, you're hiking in the bush and all those things. Yep. You have to constantly think, problem solve, innovate, BJJ, innovate, problem solve. Yeah. Um, so those things are going to make people better and better. I'm always doing that with my son, giving him a little problem to solve. Right. And um, getting him to do it. I mean, what's it that keeps you motivated now? You know, do you, ha- do you have like a higher purpose goal you're, or- you're kind of oriented towards? Like, you know, I'm reducing the suffering of people in the world and that's what, you know, no. I keep- or, you know, because most people kind of look who have careers, they, they want to get to retirement, they get yeah. to retirement, there's no structure in their life and then that's it. You no, know? I don't, I don't do that. Yeah. Um, I don't even, <laughs> this may sound weird, but I, I, I don't believe that much in goal setting. Okay. I'm not a, well, okay, I'm not a goal setter. Put it that way. Well, what, what's the story then you're kind of telling yourself about your own life, you okay. know, that keeps you kind of moving? I, I will, I, I like to use a term that I call fuzzy goals. Yeah. So a fuzzy goal to me is like a general compass bearing. I know I want to go north. So I don't, I don't, I don't lock into north and start walking to my goal. Because there's a giant fissure, a cavern, a lake, a river in front of me. Yeah. So I get a general compass bearing. I want to go that way. But once I know that, I put my eyes on the ground immediately in front of me. Yeah. So that does two things. One, stops me from stepping on a snake, falling down a hole, or getting stuck in a bog. Yeah. And two, keeps me where I should be, which is tethered to the moment and the present, enjoying my life. Right. Enjoying the whole journey and not being focused on this ridiculous goal. That even if I hit it, then what? Yeah, yeah. You, you know, do you think when you get to the top of Everest and jam that flag in the top, you go, that's the moment? No. It was the years of planning, the yeah. training. That was where the joy is. All of that. The, pl- the flag in the top is like, eh, meh, I think you say nowadays. Yeah. Meh, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, so I believe in fuzzy goals, like a rough right. direction. And the other thing about that is if my goal is fuzzy, I'm much more able to adapt and change direction, right? which I have done many times. I want to go there. I want to do that. Yeah. You know what? This is better. And I head left. I'm not locked into my goal, needing to tick it off. So I'm a fuzzy goal guy, not yeah. a hard goal guy. Um, that's part of the answer to your question. Okay. But I, look, we've got one life. I'm going to be dead in 25, within 25 years. You know, you've got a bit longer, but we're all, it's finite. It's going to end. Um, I want to enjoy it all as much as I can. So I'm I'm more about enjoying now. Right now I'm present. I'm with you, Nathan. I'm here. I'm not thinking about tonight or tomorrow or anything like that. 
But that, that yeah. enjoyment's like a bit different. Sorry to interrupt. Um, because, say, like eating a load of pizza, sitting down, uh, doing nothing, that's enjoyable. Or, you know, like people like, oh, I want to go on holiday. But yeah. when people win the lottery, yeah. they te- lottery, yeah. <laughs> they oh tend goodness. to, uh, they tend to, you know, get depressed. You know, the, for the first week, they're drinking a margarita on a beach. That's great. Yeah. But then four weeks in, they're a beach drunk and they've got nothing to do. You know, yeah. so is there any kind of... Well, you know, well, the, re- well the rest of what I was going to say is yeah. this. So it's, you can, it's all very good to do what I just said like live for the yeah. now and enjoy, enjoy it yeah. but even a, a squirrel with the brain the size of a pea plans for the winter right so you've heard of the richest man in Babylon yeah I read, I read that book last okay. year actually well, well let's apply that to everything not just money which is the least important thing okay let's apply it to you, your mind thinking so I want to be 90, 90% about like right now today yeah. enjoying today but ten percent of my let's I'm just picking a figure. It could be two percent. Could yeah. be right. But I've got to do some planning today for tomorrow. Right. So it's just about some planning. Yeah. So of course I've got if I want to get, you know, a house and get my house and own it and then leverage off it and get a couple more and then save money for my pension retirement and all that kind of yeah. bullshit. I I do have if I want to write a book, I have to plan. Yeah. So, you know, you've got to do some planning, mm. but you don't want to do all planning. It, it can't be all about planning for the future, then you're yeah. not enjoying now. But if you're all about now, you're not planning for the future. And I see people at the, it's like the middle, what's so the, yeah, the, the yeah. bell curve is, you know, if you're on the left hand side of the bell curve, you're all about now. You're all Eckhart, you've read Eckhart Tolle, and you yeah. go, I want to live in the now. Yeah. But even Eckhart Tolle had to plan for his seminars, his book tours, come on, right, Eckhart. You know, so he should preface yeah. his book with, I had to plan for this, and that means thinking about tomorrow, next week, tomorrow. So, you, uh, yeah, you've got to do some of that. Uh, and you can't, but you can't be all about planning. And there's a lot of people like that. They're all about planning down the track, and they're missing out on life. So it's a bit of a, uh, the right the right amount for you, and that amount, those ratios, will change depending on where you are in life. Yeah. Right? Because if you're if you're 50 years old and you've got no savings, if you have not saved 10% of what you've earned, yeah, you've spent all you've you spent. are in trouble. Yeah. Now you need to save 50% at that point of every single thing that you earn. If you're 18, you'd probably get away with 5%. Yeah. So it just depends on where you are. Yeah. yeah. Right. And so you, as we go through life, I think our goals and, and our reasons for doing things need to continually be modified. Yeah. You, you've got to continually reinvent. Why? So your purpose. You don't have a, I don't have a life purpose. I've got a purpose now, but yep. and that's different from what I was into five years ago and different yep. from 10 and 20. Right. And it needs to be. You know? Yeah, it's about transformation, is that like of yourself, not not holding on to who you are, but that's being willing to let it go for who you could become, is that? Well, that's my, my logo for my school is like Red Cat. Right. A lot of people ask me why that is. Um, yeah. There's a few different reasons, but one of the main reasons is, you know, the cat has nine lives. Right, okay. And so it's, you know, I, I, I want to be able to... The person I am now is not the person I was five years ago. Yeah. And neither are you. Yeah, yeah. And nor should we be. Yeah. And so it's it's that, um, you know, and, and and again and again and again. So that, that's a big thing for me, that continual reinvention of who you are and your priorities and what's important to you and all of those things. I mean, you were, you were talking yesterday about the... Uh, when you were talking about your son, you said about the dangers of... Um, you know, if you kind of gifted him a load of things, the same, yes. you know, you've spoken a bit about the dangers of people being gifted things today yes. and stuff. And that did actually make me think of one of the stories in The Richest Man in Babylon where he, um, you know, he gives his son a certain amount of gold, tells him to go out and return it to him in uh, like 20 years time or something. Right. And if, if he can return the same amount of gold as what he gave him, um, then he'll, you know, he'll say, right, you're suitable to kind of inherit my kingdom. And uh, I thought that that was a really interesting story um, that one for me when I kind of read it because you know he goes out like yeah of course I'll just kind of keep the money but he spent it with it you know he's got nothing and then he has to work his way up and then by the time he's worked his way up to get the money to pay his dad back off he, he no longer actually needs, needs to an area yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, which is interesting yeah yeah I oh, know that that is important um, it's, it's a struggle for a parent who's 
because they're all parents want they don't want their children to suffer yeah you know yeah that's yeah. the worst thing but suffering is what builds a character <laughs> it, it is and, and it, it's yeah. difficult and i must admit that's difficult for or me yeah. it's difficult for me with my son with my son but uh, the uh, he's just in america right now he went there last week yeah and he he arrived there and straight away um they said to him at customs immigration have you got a return ticket right and he's a very literal kid and he says he thought a ticket was the boarding pass okay so he says no oh, into, yeah and they go no and then he's into a room for an hour yeah. getting grilled by immigration so um you know melissa um, my wife uh, has called me up and she's flipping out oh my god poor felix he's all and i said yeah, no this is good like right. nothing bad happened to him yeah but that is a great thing he has learned a really interesting lesson he's learned not everyone thinks of you like we think of you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like the world out there can be really harsh. That's not harsh. That's the least harsh thing. But he needs that. You yeah. think he's going to make that mistake again? No way. Yeah. yeah. So he's learned a lesson. So he, the more of these little things that you do that harden you up or just make you the better, the better you are. So, um, yeah, that's, it's important to get – people have to earn – they have to earn things. What's the biggest perspective change you've kind of had from, you know, like you said, being this kind of like vagabond type character to being, you know, like a, having a family, having the responsibilities of yep. your own children, being a father? What, what's the what's the biggest shift that you've gone through in yourself or the biggest lesson that's kind of taught you? Mm. I, think, I think probably, you, you know, honestly, I, I think my wife has changed me, like, um, more than any, more than any single thing, right? That I've learnt myself. Okay. She's been a very, very great influence on me, and I, because she's a very, uh, very, really kind and really loving, and she's one of these like Snow White. You know, the animals love her, the kids love her, butterflies. Are, you know, she's like that, and I'm really not like that. But but if you stay, with, if I'm with someone for 25 years. A lot of them rubs off on you. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that has been a big thing for me. I'm, I'm yeah. soft. I'm more e- empathetic now. Yeah. That I ever was before. Right. And that's probably not from me. Not none of my doing. It's her doing. So, but that's you know everyone has that like. So that's why I think you have to be very careful about who you spend time with. Right. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. and it, someone said one time it was you know you're an amalgam of the five people you spend the most time with yeah i don't know about that but i don't yeah it's certainly going to have an effect that, that's one of the reasons i enjoy yes. doing podcasting is because if people can listen to something useful or listen to people who have got something good to say and they're kind of you know you can't choose your family you can't choose your work colleagues etc yes. but that maybe they can kind of raise their peer group or bounce an idea around in the head that maybe five years down the line actually changes their life that's that's one of the well you know if you have some friends if all your friends are you know, unemployed and they're not doing anything, it's very, very difficult yeah. for you to suddenly come out of left field, figure that you've got to save money, sacrifice, delay the gratification, yeah. invest that in something, leverage off that in something. and That's going to be tricky. But if yeah. you've got people around you who are doing that, you're going to feel weird about not doing it. Yeah. <laughs> and then you're going to yeah. do it. Even if you're not yeah. smart, you're going to do it. So it, it is important to be choosy and picky. But it's 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 it. I, I disagree with the idea that you're an amalgam of the five people. Yeah. Because and the reason I say that, that is because there are some people that have been a tremendous influence on me through one conversation. Right. Yeah. You know, yeah. so I'm not hanging around them. Yeah. I'm not there, but they something they said. Yeah. Just or stuck. the way they were or something they did resonated with me, and I went, "Oh my goodness!" and yeah, that changed me. So I can name, you know, more of them maybe. Right. Okay. So uh, I think it's people, right? Being open. Yeah. You be, you know, you mentioned openness. This yes. is an interesting yeah. concept. Yeah, I like that yeah. idea. Yeah. If you're open to it, yeah. and not just what do you call it, staunchly <laughs> defending a view, you know, yes, yes, which is yes, the yes, dumbest yes. thing you can do. Like, yeah, I mean, because you it know, could be wrong. <laughs> be open. Be, just be open. Yeah, yeah. Um, you agree? Disagree? Yeah. But be open because the best thing about a debate, let's say, or an argument for yeah. me would be this, that you win. Yeah. 
Yeah. Because that's that would have to mean that's life changing for me. I had yeah, this view. Yeah. yeah. I hope you win. Yeah. I that's really true. hope you win because that would be oh my god that is fantastic. Thanks Nathan. That is awesome. Yeah. I want you to open my eyes. I don't go into. I wouldn't want to go into a debate just automatically defending a position that I already you know. That, that's not learning. That's not how learning takes place. Yeah. Well, one, one of the rules in uh, 12 Rules for Life actually is always assume the person you're talking to knows something that you don't. Oh. And I was um, I was talking last week to a university <laughs> professor, a lecturer in philosophy at the uh, University of Liverpool. It was the last podcast episode I did where, and I, I asked him kind of if he'd seen any of kind of philosophy being used politically kind of on campuses etc and he said you know the the only real thing he's seen is it this discussion around free speech which he's recently had and whether they should allow free speech on campus or whether it's hate speech and stuff and you know how, how can right. you kind of how can you get to the truth you know you've got you've got to engage in discussions in good faith not to try and win a point but to try and get to the root of the root yeah. of the problem right? ideally ideally it's a collaboration ideally yeah. let's say an argument or a debate is a collaboration to find to reveal yeah. something there's an old Jewish tradition you've probably heard of it Jewish right. um, and they debate you take a view I take the opposite view we, yeah. we debate it out then yeah. we switch uh, okay <laughs> right okay yeah. at, at, le- at least then I'm I, I'm forced to see your side of it yeah and yeah. then and the truth is somewhere in the middle you know like usually yeah. right so I kind of like that idea because yeah. ultimately we we want outcomes. Yeah. I, at least I do. Yeah. Um, and there's an old saying, you may well have heard of this, it's one of my favorite sayings, um, that is the outcome is the meaning of the communication. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So if we communicate, that, but yeah. so if I, I say some sounds, I make some sounds, I can be right, and I'm yeah. doing parenthesis in the air here, folks, yeah, I can be right. So by saying these words and you're saying something else but if the outcome that I want doesn't happen I'm wrong <laughs> yeah you're right. meaning that you know so it's like um, I don't know my son's just learning how to drive and he started pointing out about a year ago oh my god that guy made a mistake he, made, that, he was in the wrong it yeah. doesn't matter if you're dead yeah, yeah if you're dead I don't give a shit if that guy's wrong yeah the trick is to avoid collision whether you're right or wrong is irrelevant yeah. <laughs> you know like so sometimes I, I think people get so locked into being correct yeah that they're not achieving the outcome they want which might be happiness you know or yeah. something like that no, so, some, of the most, <laughs> some of the most frustrating conversations I've had with people are um when they've either they've like read a book or something and they've decided uh, the specific book is I don't know if you've ever heard of it it's by a person called Ayn Rand about rational objectivism and it's what one of the most frustrating conversations I've ever had where someone said yeah this is the solution this is the answer and there is no nuance there's no you know this, this you can apply this formula to any opinion and it kind of whatever it outputs is right and it's like that's also um you know, I, I talk about, I, I probably repeat myself all the time, but in, in Milton's uh, Paradise Lost, his conception of Lucifer is like this this kind of spirit of rationality that creates something and falls in love with it and says, you know, puts it as the highest, the highest kind of, uh, not the highest, the, mo- the most important thing above all else is this creation that's made, falls in love with it and, and making everything fit into that. And I, th- I do think that's what happens with them. Um, when people get indoctrinated into political ideologies or when people are kind of stuck in ideas and there's just, there's just no nuance to the debate. There's no interest in seeking the truth. It's all about, you know, I, I'm right. And, you know, like you said before, that's how kind of wars are started. And, I, you know, I, I sincerely hope with 50% of the American population, you know, ha- kind of liking Trump's ideas and the other 50% saying that, well, there's nothing to that. You know, they've got no right to have these opinions that they can kind of reconcile it and find that middle path. It's, well, I, I did a... Um, I, I, I'm not a political. I, I don't follow yeah. politics. I'm not interested, um, you know, much. Of, uh, and um, I don't know what's happening at university campuses because I don't yeah, yeah. go to university. Um, 
So I'm away from all that, but I did a little online test a while ago because everyone's talking about left and right. Oh, yeah, yeah. I didn't even know where I was. Like yeah, seriously, yeah. I didn't know. I know yeah. I know what my views are, but I don't know what. what... Yeah, on individual topics, but like overall. It's, yeah. So yeah, I did this yeah. hundred question, and apparently I was exactly in the middle. You know? Right. Like, okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so you can say things. You know, some things are rightish and some things are leftish, but to, to automatically what do you call label yourself as left yeah, yeah. or right or this or that and then you decide what all the outcomes of their arguments are before it's, you even discuss them or yeah, yeah I don't want to do that I just want to have a I'd like to learn so yeah. I, I really would like in an ideal argument slash discussion for you to teach me something that I didn't know right. that would be the awesome thing yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. To, I'd love to be convinced I'd like to see the evidence that the world is flat yeah because yeah. that would that would mean the universe just became way more interesting yeah yeah now I don't think I don't think that's possible to do because I, <laughs> because it's absurd but yeah. but you know it would be awesome yeah, if someone yeah. could show me that I go yeah. wow yeah, I've just become just really much idea. more interested yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, so I think it's good to learn. I, you know I was talking the other night I think teaching and being a teacher or being a student sounds like maybe at university you're a lecturer a professor or you're a student yeah I have almost a different view of how I think that should be right to me it's much certainly in an environment I don't want someone yelling at me I uh, but but um, I think it should be much more of a collaboration it is a collaboration we're, we're trying to get an outcome right and whatever I play a role you play a role yeah and unless we can get some connection, yeah, yeah. nothing's going to happen. So if you're a you know a a, 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 um, a bad student and I'm a good teacher, yeah, you know, if you're a bad student, I'm a bad teacher. There's no outcome. Yeah. And if you're a bad student and I'm a good teacher, there's not much outcome. But if you're a good student and I'm a bad teacher, there's some outcome, a little bit better maybe. But if you're yeah. a good student and I'm a good teacher. It's a collaboration and you get great outcomes. So it is really about connecting up with people. Yeah. And so it's not about this adversarial thing that I do see there's a lot of that. Yeah. And that's that's awesome for, I don't know, I think it probably has, it, I don't think it changes many people's minds. What yeah. I think it might do is just um, well, give, you practice at, more, right? give you practice at debating your yeah. points. Yeah. You know, so if you want to talk Here about the, the stock outcome for yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know you learn the ten good things to say to yeah. prove to to, to the back up the idea 70, that women are paid seventy percent for every dollar a man. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, or being an atheist, or it doesn't matter. Yeah. You know, you just you listen to enough yeah. stuff, you get your arguments down, so you can win a debate. Yeah, but yeah. so you want to win a debate? Why? Mm. Why do I want to do that? So you can feel oh, comprehensive that you're so you viewing can, the world's right. And maybe, okay. but it doesn't do anything. It yeah, doesn't change yeah. them. It doesn't change anyone. Yeah. Um, I'd rather achieve outcomes, actually. Yeah. I'd just rather... And, and when I say achieve outcomes, for other, I'd, mother, I'd rather other people walk away a better version yeah. of themselves after some interaction with me and me, me yeah. walk away having benefited also from the interaction. Yeah. So that's, it's not so much this... Two sides of a chess match, yeah. you know. You said you said something last year um, about um, your approach to teaching people, which kind of changed my perspective on a lot of things. And I've spoke to Adam about it as well, and he said, in terms of his business, the results came not when he focused on like marketing or not, when, but when he focused on delivering the highest quality product that he could. Yeah. Mm. And you said, in terms of your teaching, you know that that you've got to understand the gravity of the situation when you're being put in a teaching situation that yes. these people have yes. put themselves through a job they hate yep. they've paid their mortgage they've, they've bought the food they've put the kids to school maybe they're missing out on some time they could have had in a relationship yeah. and they're giving you their money to be here on the mat and share yeah. this space with you yeah. and I thought that that was um, you know that that understanding the gravity of yes. or the, the amount of responsibility that's placed upon you whenever you're a teacher or whenever you're providing a product and you're expecting someone to give up their time yes. to, um, to kind of approach that that really changed my, my perspective on that I, I like the way that you put that that was really well done like gravity that's a nice word and that's I, I, I can't think of a better way to describe it because you have to attend to what's happening um, so two people have come to the mat. In this view, say, for example, if I'm the coach and you're the student, I must understand what's going on here, not just automatically go into teaching. 
you and you you've um, you've given up your time to earn the money to pay me if you're paying me to come to a martial arts class and then you've given up the time to travel there and then you've given up the actual time on the mat yeah. and then you've got time to travel home if you add all that up it might be 10 hours of time I don't know let's say just say 10 hours of your time that you cannot get back that is invaluable invaluable there is no money you could that is invaluable thing that you are trading for, for me to teach you something for that time my god I realize that understand it for what it is I can't do anything better than my absolute best yeah I, and and plan that that make all guys planning thinking coming up with what do you need how can I best deliver it so we both get it yeah that's why I say it's a collaboration yeah it's not me going blah 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 like it or leave it mate you yeah know, it's not yeah. that it's not me 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 no it is you and I two different yeah. human beings sharing a little bit of moment in time together and both came to that from and I came to it from all this other time that I like Rosie Sexton with her yeah. great work and someone complains that she's charging 50 pounds or 45 pounds a session mm. what she's not paying she's giving Did you that session that? for that free what? mate the 45 yeah. pounds is for the 10 years effort she put in yeah, it's yeah. for the petrol it's for the insurance it's yeah. she uses electricity it's for the electricity <laughs> she drives a leaf uh, she, yeah, yeah. It's, all, it's all of that what she's doing she's doing it 90% out of love yeah, you, yeah. You're, you're not paying for that and yeah. so that's a not, it's a purer idea, right? And I, I think we both should get it. I should understand you, what you're doing, and how you got there. You should understand how I got there, right? And then, then we can get down to business. And I, yeah. I think that's really important. I got given some uh, specific questions from the guys at the gym when I said, you know, I said I was going to be talking to you. Is there anything anyone wanted to kind of ask you, or um, you know, that they've not had the opportunity to do? And so it is ten past eleven now, Tom. So. Um, the first question I got given is um, how have you achieved the longevity in the sport both physically and mentally that you have okay because I'm really really interested <laughs> but physically as well you oh, know like, okay. like I mean I'm 21 and well, you said mentally. Like 10 injury- yeah physically so, hey, and mentally okay. yeah, sorry, yeah. so I'll go for the mental part mentally okay. I'm I'm not I, I never rest on my laurels I'm interested I want to keep up I want to learn the latest things something comes out something's trending I want to be a Brit. I want to be on top of that, all across it. I want to understand it. So that's um, selfish in a way. I'm trying to. I do that because I'm interested, and that keeps me mentally engaged and fresh and all of that, which makes the sharing easy because I'm, you know, sharing with my peers and um, physically um, just doing it and not buying into old man jujitsu, which I don't believe in. Uh, you know, this whole, whole thing. Um, I'm into my main strategy uh, is denial um, I just deny the fact that I'm 61 years of age and I know I'm going to a- yeah. attend to it as best I can as if I was 21 years old however it's easy for me to do that because I'm not doing a 9 to 5 job and right. so I yeah. can and my wife is really good she's a, all about the nutrition and all oh, of that okay. yeah. so it's like I've got a professional yeah, yeah. I, I'm like a professional athlete in that way <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, yeah. you know all that's taken care of for yeah. them that would be much harder if I was single and yeah. looking after myself like oh my goodness it would take time and energy right. so there's that uh, I do three sessions a week of interval training like a you know um, Tabata type strength <laughs> training yeah. session so that helps a lot and you need to yeah. do that the older you get Okay. Um, yeah. That becomes more important. So. Have, you, have you had any kind of big injuries that you've had to... I mean, obviously, everyone gets something in jiu-jitsu. I can't imagine you've gone your whole career with nothing, but... No, you, I've had, like, had uh, five knee operations, one right. elbow operation, okay. Lo- okay. lots of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm fine. I, you know, I can still do a... You just do your rehab and it's okay. A four-foot yeah. high box jump with a... Yeah, right. I can still do all those things. Yeah, I don't... I don't... Um, because I want to get back to training. Yeah. I mean, the last knee operation I had, just a scope, a couple yep. of scopes. I was training three days later after that. So I'm not using that as an excuse not to... I, I'm keen to get back on there. Right. So, and you can almost... You can't with some back stuff. You know, it's debilitating. Yeah. But most times... You, yeah, there's something you can do. You can do something. Yeah. You can stick your hand in your belt and work your legs. Yeah. You can not use that arm and develop a half guard. You know? Yeah, you, yeah. Which is how a lot of things got developed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Um, so, yeah, I want, I want to get back into training as quick as I can after injuries. But, yeah, I don't find it hard. Um, what mindset should you have when training in order to boost your learning? So I suppose that's a little bit like yeah. um, what you were saying about collaboration. I think you should... Um, there's a lot of learning tricks that I use. Um, one of the simple ones that I would recommend, I've got lots of them, but one of the simple ones that I started doing 30 years ago in jiu-jitsu, any technique you learn, you say to yourself, what, 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 how is my left hand contributing? How is my right hand contributing? What role is my right hand playing? Right. My right leg, my left leg. So ask those four questions, one of each for each limb, and then in what direction? Okay. Sometimes that's hard to answer, but usually techniques have a very specific kind of direction. So if you ask those five questions every time, what's my right hand doing? What role is my left hand playing? What role is my right leg playing? What role? And you you can answer them. Right. You're going to be ninety percent there on that technique. Okay. So that's a useful thing. Um, don't worry about trying, like meaning failing. So be okay with that. There's no outcome for. There's no sorry. There's no price tag. Like if you fail rock climbing without a rope, there's a there's a price. And if I ask you, we're going to rock climb, and we're not using ropes, you might agree to it, but you're only going to climb a very low grade climbs. Yeah. That that you have almost no possibility of falling off. Therefore, you'll never improve. So you have to have a safety net. Yeah. And if you have a safety net, you can try anything. So what's the safety net on the map? Yeah. Um, the safety net is you're pu- creating a culture where it's okay to tap out. Right, trust as well. Yes, well, I'm okay to tap. Yeah. And the whole mat's like that, then everyone tries everything and gets really good. So a lot of the time, it's about the culture on the mat. It's much harder to do if the culture's not like that. Right, yeah. In what ways do you see ego as detrimental to learning and in what ways is it beneficial? Well, it's, de- it's detrimental because if people don't want to look bad and look silly, they won't try things. And, and then if you don't try things, you're just doing the same old, same old. Right. So that's what a lot of... I've seen that's a big drama. I'm okay with looking silly. Don't care. Um, so so that's okay. And that... Of course, it's easier to do that when you're 60 because people expect you to goof off and fall over every now and again. Yes. So kind of you've got nothing to lose. It's harder to do as a young man yep. because people feel that they will be judged harshly by their peers. Yeah, you know, and that's probably a tribal thing, right? Right. If yeah. I can't, if I throw every time I throw a spear, I throw it and stab another tribesman. I'm becoming low on the totem pole. Yeah. Now I don't get the prime cuts of meat. I'm not fed. I'm not looked after. So no one. There's a lot of pressure on people to perform. I've, I've heard that's actually why young men like video games so much, because they tap into that biological part of wanting to try things in the world but because there's no consequences you're not actually getting judged by society for failure so it's like it's like yeah I can be this hero and do all these things but but there's no real consequences so I don't have to worry about that yeah. Kind of, yeah. so consequences that's the problem so if you, you've got to create safety nets Okay. you have to do it financially you know you want to create a safety net you have to do it emotionally you know who's your friends and who you know who's going to say Nathan you blew it but hey you're awesome go again yeah. and, and your team for you know so you, you have to create some kind of safety nets. Right. The more you have, then the yeah. more risks you can take. And I, I think the next question is almost like a higher resolution version of that. It was, it's um, you know, should you worry about kind of defending your belt at different levels and you know getting tapped by lower belts or trying to tap higher belts? Should, should you worry about those? Well, I think that's natural. Um, it's you know, I don't, I don't, I think we all worry too much about it. It's a belt. It's a color. It's a it's a wavelength on a spectrum. You yeah. know, like seriously, um, don't get all. It's it, it's probably not as important as what people think. You know, um, there are people that would look at that and just laugh because their child's got cancer. Yeah. I mean, seriously. Yeah. Um, perspective, right? But I, it's natural to, and it should mean something. Don't misunderstand me. It's you should. Um, it should mean something. So you want to live up, live up to it. But what I've found in the over the years is. You people rise to the rank. You've probably experienced it yourself. Right. You know, you get a purple belt or a blue belt, and you know, two weeks later, you're slightly better. <laughs> like, yeah. Because of that exact reason, right. because you feel that, oh my goodness, I need to, I need to step it up. Now yeah. you could have stepped it up without that, but there's something about that that, you know, um, 
I think it's good. You, something's yeah. conferred upon you, yeah, and you have to live up to it, yeah. and that's good. It's yeah, like you can passing a rite of passage. Oh, okay. Now yeah. I'm a man, as an Indian or as yeah, whatever. I, I'm a man. I, I better. I've got to step up my game. You could yeah. have just done that without the rite of passage, but I think rites of passage are kind of important. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what's the most common mistake you see people taking in their approach to jiu-jitsu? In what approach? Uh, in their approach. Oh, their so approach. I suppose to maybe mentally or physically, like actually, like not drilling, rolling too much, or maybe yeah. you know beating themselves up too much. Um, tr- looking to hit the end of the technique rather than doing the steps needed to do the technique. Right. So, in other words, not being present. So, if I'm looking to the end of the technique, I'm living in the future. If I'm worried about something that happened two seconds ago, I'm living in the past. I think that's a very big mistake. Right. Being present in the moment, that's very, very good. In fact, that's what I that's the quality I look for for Bluebell. Right, okay. Now I have a list of physical requirements. Yeah, yeah. But I don't care about that. Yeah, if you're not approaching Because you can you can do that in a hard weekend. It doesn't mean you're a blue belt. Yeah. The quality I'm looking for, apart from the twenty eight physical requirements, mm. is that quality. I mean, um, that almost ties into the next question, which is about kind of, you, you know, a lot, a lot of martial arts have kind of been watered down um, as they've kind of gone on. Do you worry about that happening with jiu-jitsu with kind of online, you know, you can get your blue belt online now in some places, or even you, you see some gyms kind of breaking off and going, oh, this, this new school jiu-jitsu, it's all gay, sitting on your bum doing this. You've got to be... Do you, do you um, worry, worry about the that. sport fractioning? Or? Yes. Um, look, I, I, I don't worry about it. No, of course not, I don't worry. People can do what they want. Yeah. And people can do what they want. You know, there's right. no right yeah. or wrong. Yeah. Like, people can do whatever they want because their time is their time. And if it's giving them joy and pleasure, who the hell am I to judge, right. you know, about what they do? Yeah. I'm the least person that can judge. Um, so I just... I, now, I, I don't agree with a lot of these approaches people take from me, but I'm in no position to judge whatever they do. So I'm not the BJJ police. They can do what they want. So I'm not worried about it. But it, it's I don't. I am not dropping. I'm not dropping the ball right. in terms of quality control. You know, yeah. it's ten years or more to get a black belt, and it should be that, um, in my view, in my right. school. Yeah. People are taking fourteen years. I mean. You know, there's other people that are fast and have done it in, maybe they'll do it in eight or nine years. Right. But it's not going to be four years to black belt. So, but people do it. And people, there's people out there who think that rank cares. Right. I, you know, I've seen some people recently put a stripe on that they have not earned and the time is not up on their black belt. Yeah, yeah. Made themselves a higher level black belt. Okay. I've gone, right. who did, how did you do the math on that, mate? Yeah. You're out by 10 years. And you weren't even training, and you didn't even have a school. You just what the? But here's the weird thing to me: in their mind, that matters. Right. No one okay. cares. Yeah, yeah. You could you could be a you could be a purple belt with 150, 200 students because you care about people and you do a good job. Yeah. No one's going to give a rat's ass about your belt. Right. You put a stripe around there, you think that's going to give you more clients? Yeah. No one's looking when you walk into a shrink's office or a doctor's office or an engineer's office. No one's going to look at the certificate on the wall, read the five prints, see. They just want to know, can you help me? Can you design my house? Yeah. Can you do the heart surgery? <laughs> give a shit about that stuff. So that's a personal thing. Um, but it's happening. It's happening. Not in my school, uh, but yeah. What's the area in life that you feel you've wasted the most time and what advice would you give to help people avoid the same thing? Probably probably financially, I was didn't give a hoot about saving for my future until I was about 35 until I was about 40 years old. Right, okay. Now, I made up for it, so now I don't need to work ever again, and I've got a financially independent and all of that stuff, so I'm working for the pure reason, yeah. just because I want to. Yeah, not just chasing a paycheck. No, no I don't need to, right? Yeah. So that's a, that's a freedom that's really nice. So the earlier you could do that would be lovely, right? The beautiful thing about being financially independent is now you, you're doing things for the right reasons, um, which is really nice. That means it's authentic. 
So I would recommend it. So not for the money, but because then it will allow you to become more authentic. Right. Which is good. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's where I didn't care earlier enough. I wish I'd read The Richest Man in Babylon. I wish I'd saved 10% of everything I earned when I was 20 and not when I was 40. Now, I did it between 40 and 55. So I did it over 15 years worth, okay? But please do it earlier. Yeah. yeah. And that way you'll be where I am now 20 years earlier Mm -hmm. and therefore you'll be able to say, I don't like those people. I don't like who they are. I'm not spending time with them. And that's nice to be yeah. able to do that. And and therefore you are more authentic and therefore the people that you are with know that you want to be there for them and it's all better. Yeah. The, the money thing's out of the way now. Okay. And that's kind of nice. So I would advise people to. I mean, I've got I've got two questions I kind of close with, with all my guests. Uh, the first of which is, if you could pick up the telephone to your 20-year-old self, uh, what would you tell yourself? Marry my wife earlier. <laughs> um, 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 that's a good question. I think I would, I would repeat what I just said. I would, I would say, delay the gratification. Spend ten percent of your brain thinking about tomorrow. Right. Only be ninety percent present today, mm-hmm. and not a hundred percent, which I was much more like that. So um, put a bit of thought into tomorrow and planning because that'll pay off hugely with freedom and authentic living down the track. Okay. I would well, say that. I've got like a, it's a similar take, but sometimes it makes people kind of think about the question a bit differently. Is if there's a 20 year old who's listening to this and, um, you know, they're, they're worrying about what they're doing with their life, they're thinking, yeah. Um, oh, I'm becoming an adult. What does all this mean? They're being overwhelmed with all this stuff at that point in their life. But what what's the um, what advice would you give to them at that particular moment? You have to walk the path to be joyful. You've got to be. It's not about what kind of car you drive. It's not about all those things. You know, I don't want pe- people to misunderstand what I said about financial independence. It's about being joyful. And that's what, so you, so you do not want to trade 20 years of your life doing something that does not, you know, float your boat just to get money. That's not any good. That's a waste of the most precious thing in the universe, which is time. And billionaires and paupers alike have time. That In that respect, they are identical. And enjoy that time. You know, spend some of it with some what's called forward planning, right? because that, you're investing in your future time but you've got to enjoy yourself and um, whatever that is and if you want to be a DJ but you're getting peer pressure to go to university and be a lawyer but you don't love that don't do it do not do it find a way to do your DJ thing and and, and learn everything about it be the best you possibly can at it to the point where because there's plenty of room at the top right right and not at the bottom at the top, there's all the room in the world. Be the best. And at that, and you'll find a way to monetize that. So let the money take care of itself. Don't worry. Be great. Just be great. Be the awesomest version of whatever you like doing, whether that's gardening, growing flowers, being a DJ, writing books, or doing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, or being a lawyer. Yeah. But do it because you love it. Yeah. Find the thing that you love. And that might be mean being open to trying a lot of things for five or ten years. You might have to uh, dabble for yep. ten years before you go, wow, I love that. I love how I feel when I do that. And then go for that. Go for that. You don't have, I didn't start till I was on that path till I was 30, 35. So there's plenty of time. There's no need to make a decision at 18 or 20 or 25. Yeah. Take five, take a five year, take a half a decade gap. <laughs> yeah. And you'll learn a lot. Yeah. So just before I close up, is there anything you want to kind of give a shout out to, or you know your your gym if people are over in Australia and they want to visit, or any any website or anything you want? 
Uh, yeah, I, I've read Cat Academy. Uh, I'm in Geelong, an hour out of Melbourne. Uh, so anyone listening to this or traveling, feel free to drop into my school. Um, yeah, a big uh, hello to everyone I'm on the road. All my friends in the UK where I'm, I'm holidaying right now and then I'm in Italy. My wife's meeting me next week for our annual kind of vacation and uh, great thanks to all my friends in the UK, that's for sure, who have who I've visited and they've made me feel welcome. It's been really great um, to see everybody. So, And thanks to Rosie, Rosie Sexton, who's bought me some shoes. I got a blister on my foot the other day for doing a 20 mile. Someone said it's only an eight mile walk up to this village. It wasn't an eight mile walk, it was a 20 mile walk. I got a blister on the back of my foot and um, Rosie says, buy some Vivo shoes, it'll fix it. So she's got some shoes for me arriving for me at tomorrow's seminar venue. So. Thanks to Rosie, she's awesome. Um, yeah, th- and thanks very much, Nathan. No, for, thanks for, for doing time. this. You know, I don't have a podcast without people who are willing to give up their time and do it. So, uh, you know, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh,